about some of the readings for this week. Um, first of all, talking about Havel and Smith. Um, uh, you know, I think what's really interesting about someone like Havel and Smith is the access and close proximity he would have had to um, uh, the preparations uh, for the war. He um, will understand as well as anyone else that um, there was very muddled arguments presented in 2002, 2003 in favor of the invasion of Iraq. We know now, retrospectively, things that Havilland Smith himself hasn't even talked about in his piece. I can just uh, summarize some of them for you. Uh, we know, for example, from the British uh, controversies concerning the so-called Downing Street Memo, you can look it up online, and the official government report that was published this year in 2016, the Chilcot Report, um, we know from both of these documents that Tony Blair and his government in Downing Street already were quite aware that the U.S. security apparatus, that the uh, intelligence services, if you want to put it that way, um, knew full well there were no WMDs in Iraq. And they knew that before they ever went in. Um, but um, the uh, pretense, the external pretense, um, went ahead regardless. Um, that there were WMDs and we had, you know, regardless of the fact that of the knowledge to the contrary, um, we had people like um, uh, Colin Powell uh, present in front of the United Nations, uh, very fancy computerized graphics showing um, weapons trucks, mobile labs moving around um, Iraq uh, that were allegedly making chemical weapons and such. And, and, you know, they've been over Iraq with a fine tooth comb ever since, and those weapons have never been found. Um, there were some hints that that was the case even before 2003. Uh, there's a famous interview with Paul Wolfowitz, uh, retrospectively, uh, where he um, uh, concedes that the WMD argument was a pretext as he says, it was an argument that we used for bureaucratic reasons. Uh, this was in an interview that he did in Vanity Fair, which you can look up, um, where he argued in a fact that the weapons of mass destruction had, had never been the most compelling justification for invasion of Iraq. Um, in fact, um, it, was a, it was a pretext of an argument um, because it was the one thing that they could get everyone to agree on. There were actually a number of different constituencies from kind of more progressive um, human rights uh, advocates like Michael Ignatiev, the Canadian scholar, and uh, Sebastian Malaby, people like this, who were, um, you know, intellectuals that would have been very known in Western foreign policy circles and that believed that Saddam Hussein was a vile dictator and that he had to go. Um, then there were also the neocons like Paul Wolfowitz, who believed that America had a compelling geostrategic interest, um, as they wrote in the Plan for a New American Century document. Um, which is still available online. You can Google it, Plan for a New American Century, sometimes known as PNAC, P-N-A-C, Plan for a New American Century. Uh, you can go and check that out um, if you want, and uh, you should know that that's uh, one of the major neoconservative documents that was written during the Clinton administration. Uh, where they produced a series of op-eds where they, uh, including people like Paul Wolfowitz, um, called on... Um, Bill Clinton to step up action in Iraq um, in order to uh, prevent uh, Iraq re-emerging as a power. Um, Iraq was under blockade at the time by U.S. Uh, military and had been since George Bush Sr. Uh, very, very uh, difficult uh, for many Iraqi people um, to survive that blockade. Um, but, uh, yeah, the PNAC document basically expressed a fear and a concern that um, an emergent China or India down the road would be able to ally with, uh, with Iraq to create a kind of a counterforce to American unipolarity in the world in a post-Cold War scenario. So, um, uh, you, you, know, you know, interesting, we just had the diversity of, of, of reasons then to want to go into Iraq from sort of the more liberal mindset and the more conservative mindset, what Wolfowitz was arguing was that, you know, these contending arguments, the one that seemed to bind them all together and make an, uh, you know, unify all these voices um, would be the WMD argument. And so um, this was uh, uh, why the, the reason why they went for it. Um, so, um, you know, we know from the biographies of Richard Clark and Paul Neal, um, uh, that um, already the day after 9-11, Donald Rumsfeld was very keen to attach blame 
uh, for 9-11 or a connection at least uh, for with 9-11 uh, and Iraq and Saddam Hussein uh, some, somehow having been involved in it. Um, and we know also from the biography Fair Game, which is the story of Valerie Plame, who is the wife of Ambassador Joe Wilson, uh, who'd famously been sent to Niger in order to prove that the Iraqis were trying to get yellow cake uranium. And when he found, when he got there, he found out that there was no uh, yellow cake uranium uh, deal with Iraq and that the documents that he was supposed to be looking at were forgeries. Um, and when he came back and he tried to explain this in an op-ed, um, the Bush administration went after him because he had pretty much broken ranks with the government. Um, and um, in revenge for this, um, William Scooter Libby, the White House, uh, Secre White House Chief of Staff, um, Scooter Libby um, outed uh, Ambassador Joe Wilson's wife as an undercover uh, CIA agent, which is a very dangerous thing to do. Um, and it's against the law. Um, and actually, uh, Scooter Libby went to jail for that, although he's subsequently pardoned by George Bush Jr. Um, so all of that uh, as a very roundabout way of saying um, and as a roundabout way of, of trying to understand Haviland Smith when he says that, um, you know, things like intellectual capability were the last desperate refuge of the Bush administration in trying to justify the war intellectual capability being of course this idea that well they may not have WMDs but they have the intellectual capability to make the WMDs and they're working on that actively working on that and you're just like well they don't really have WMDs so it doesn't matter what the intellectual capability is because you can't go around the world engaging in preemptive strikes on people for thinking things I mean if if um, you know if thinking is a, is a crime we could probably all be locked up um, uh, so um, in this sense, what Haviland Smith is saying, and I, I guess my own little uh, uh, digression there, uh, is, is all really about this sort of idea that um, the invasion of Iraq was, was an ideological decision, sort of. And I think that's Haviland Smith's conclusion, um, not really to do with anything to do with 9-11. Now, all of that, why does he go into this point? Because effectively, domestically within the US, there was a real culture of fear a uh, culture against standing up to the United States government. Um, even domestically, journalists, intellectuals were very afraid after 9-11 to criticize the Bush administration. And um, it wasn't really until uh, some time later, uh, much more recently, in fact, probably with the Obama administration and the revelations of people like Edward Snowden that we've really started to see um, a, a much sort of greater willingness to stand up to government, to challenge, to address government uh, for some of the policies that Obama administration has been carrying over from the Bush years, including uh, keeping open Guantanamo Bay and um, extending domestic surveillance um, and also the drone strikes. Um, so um, this leads Haviland Smith to, to raise a point, you know, that in a culture of fear, you're not going to get the openness of mind to really think about the strategies you need to be pursuing to win the war. Um, what Havlin Smith concludes in saying is that, you know, this culture of fear won't do um, because in order to win this, we need to get real about Muslim culture. Uh, we can't go around thinking that they're all Al-Qaeda. Um, Islamic culture, Muslim culture has huge internal diversity. Um, there's a, a, a different myriad different kinds of Muslims and uh, and so you know if an organization like Hamas in in Palestinian territories um, wins an election yeah they're Islamist you know they're 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 even militant but they're not global jihadis they don't really have an interest in flying airliners into skyscrapers in New York City um, so Havlin Smith is saying like to win this we need to be able to differentiate between these groups and we need to understand that they're not all out to get us and that they're you need different tools to deal with the different situations um, you can't uh, militarize everything and conversely then back at home you can't be suppressing the civil liberties of people um, uh, you have to take a very realistic attitude to um, privacy rights and also the need for people to, um, uh, you know, have a freedom of conscience. Uh, this culture of fear, as we were saying, it, it won't do. Um, it, it, it suppresses freedom of thought and it uh, prevents us holding government to account. 
um, and challenging uh, some of these ideas uh, that uh, seem to get circulated all too conveniently and easily, um, you know, you know, concerning um, the war on terror, concerning the, our need to to fight it and win it through military means. Um, moving on, um, I, I thought this piece by Robert Pape was very interesting and informative. Um, as he says in 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 the study, they uh, do a survey of every suicide attack from 1980 to 2003 all over the world right it's a huge study very very fascinating for us and what they find of course is that uh, looking at all the suicide attacks that have occurred in this 23 year window of time um, that the greatest reliance of suicide warfare is not at all by muslims but rather by uh, more secular organizations for example the tamil tigers in sri lanka were the world leaders in suicide bombing and they were a marxist leninist group composed primarily of hindus not of muslims at all um, so this leads robert pate to conclude that suicide terror is specifically um, a secular and strategic methodology uh, secular in the sense that it's really not that much to do with islam uh, in, in in the case of muslim terror um, there's a there's a, actually a prohibition on, on suicide in the religious faith of Islam um, and that also that has a strategic goal which we'll talk about in just a minute so his argument revolves around this idea then that neither Islam nor religion in general are the primary drivers of suicide attacks um, Peter Shepetiak uh, we were talking at, at the start of today's session um, about your journal from last week and I mean this is this is the interesting point. I'd love to see your response to this in your journal for this week um, and whether you've changed your mind or whether this piece would have persuaded you to rethink your, your viewpoint. Um, certainly, it, it helps me rethink certain things. Um, so so um, religion is, is not a really a driver. Um, in fact, there tend to be much more sort of secular goals, um, uh, strategic goals or strategic rationales, if you will, um, that are at stake here. So um, this is where Pape argues that there's three patterns of uh, in the evidence around suicide attacks, suicide bombings, and that um, belie the idea that they are carried out by radical evildoers, which is sort of the term uh, that George Bush used. First of all, that they are large, coherent campaigns. Um, they are largely uh, oriented towards... Um, 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 <clears throat> uh, largely oriented towards uh, 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 sustaining uh, some sort of military strategic campaign. They're not once-off radical uh, attacks. Um, uh, second of all, um, the specific strategic vulnerability of democracy, you know, you, you wouldn't use a suicide attack on a dictatorship. There's not much point. Um, there's something about democracies um, that make suicide attacks particularly um, um, sensational and effective um, methods. And that is, of course, because of the media, right? Uh, suicide bombing gets media attention and um, gets people in democracies to think maybe a little bit differently, perhaps gets them intimidated, makes them afraid, uh, puts them on the back foot. So there's a, there's a, there's a fear, a methodology of trying to instill a certain modicum of fear um, in this sense, that's specifically to do with democracies. Uh, so there's definitely a rationale to the method in that regards. It's not a blind, um, evil-doing type of terrorism in that sense as well. And then finally, most importantly, I would argue, uh, is the strategic objectives. Um, if you say someone's an evildoer, it just means that they're in interested in wanton destruction. That's not actually what Al-Qaeda seemed to be about with the attacks on 9-11, although, of course, they did cause wanton destruction. Um, but if you look at the history of Al-Qaeda, and specifically bin Laden and his statements for up to a decade prior to the attacks of 9-11, uh, you see that he had been communicating through, through fax machines, through various forms of uh, publicity, um, several demands, including a withdrawal of foreign soldiers from the Holy Lands, which would be Saudi Arabia. There's a large U.S. military presence in Saudi Arabia. Um, so, you know, if, if he was just a, a blind, you know, irrational evildoer driven by his passions, why was he expressing concrete strategic political objectives like that? Um, you know, so the terrorism that he was carrying out, uh, even up to a decade beforehand, uh, various attacks on U.S. embassies around the world, that kind of thing. 9-11 was not the first time we'd heard of this guy. Um, 
all these um, um, sort of um, communications from him uh, definitely give us a sense that you know the man wasn't a, a, an irrational person at all. He he had a very concrete goal, and um, and and was pursuing that. So with that in mind, uh, Robert Pape says, you know, we need kind of kind of like what our previous uh, commentator was saying. We need a new conception of victory. Uh, we need to start thinking about. Um, um, how to deal with um, suicide, terrorism, uh, how to deal with uh, the um, resentment that leads to suicide, terrorism, um, how to deal with it um, in the sense of its, you know, on the level of its objectives, you know, uh, uh, talking with it, in other words, at the level of its objectives, um, not just saying you're not going to talk to them because they're evil, actually getting involved. Which leads us to our last uh, piece, which is Ali Gomas's piece, very, very short piece. And so rather than speak about it per se, I'm just going to give you a little bit of the context that this piece evokes to me in terms of its debate. Um, so Ali Gomas is a, is a, is a, a, a well-known intellectual figure in the Middle East um, already. And his short little piece just talks about the various meanings of the word jihad. And of course, last week we talked about jihad as in terms of striving. Um, I wanted to this week um, um, just contextualize this for you by talking about debates between various people, uh, intellectuals post 9 11, um, like Bernard Lewis and Edward Said. Bernard Lewis had famously argued that the problem that you could sort of attribute Islamic terrorism to was the fact that they had never had um, an enlightenment, uh, whereas Europe in the 17th and 18th century had had an intellectual awakening. Um, which led to a uh, sort of a scientific revolution and ultimately to the birth of a rationality of government which separated church and state because previously to that point in time religious values would have guided our government um, um, that the, the Middle East never had that development, right? So never having had an enlightenment, um, religious principles still by and large guide uh, the Muslim attitude towards government. Um, to this point, um, raised by Bernard Lewis, Edward Said, who is, a, well, he's dead now, but he was a scholar who, who spent his whole lifetime studying the way the Western world studies and writes and thinks about Islamic culture. And what he said is that uh, Bernard Lewis's argument uh, was yet another bit of evidence that the people in the West tend to have this very sort of romanticized uh, reading of the Middle East. Um, they look at the Middle East as exotic, as passionate, driven by the passions, um, not driven by rationality. Um, and so Muslims are sort of seen as emotional people before they're seen as uh, thoughtful people. Whereas in the West, supposedly because of our reformed and enlightened minds and our separation of church and state it's thought that we don't have the passions at all you know that we are not we don't govern ourselves through emotional ideas and categories we govern ourselves through hardcore rationalities stoic um you know appraisals of 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 utility and we act on the basis of what we need not on the basis of how we feel uh, and edward said basically says that you know, this is a very romantic uh, portrayal of Islamic culture, that if you look at it historically, uh, many of the things that we think that we invented were actually invented there, um, not only in terms of science and mathematics, but in terms of um, um, the very principle of religious tolerance um, was, was um, originally um, founded in the Dark Ages when Europe had the uh, Spanish Inquisition and was persecuting religious minorities. Um, and uh, it was then that the Islamic Caliphate, at uh, the height of its power, um, said to the refugees that were fleeing Europe, especially Jewish people, you can come and live among us uh, because we, have, we will introduce um, freedom of religious um, practice. And so, in fact, really for the first time in the world, in, 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 in sort of modern history anyway, you, you, you would sort of, I'm sort of um, mincing my words here. I don't mean modern history. May this be more uh, what we would think of the medieval period. But point being um, that the Islamic world uh, was really the first in a sort of a, a, a recognizable sense uh, to introduce uh, the idea of freedom of religious practice 
Um, and so if you today go to Damascus or Baghdad, you'll see um, um, religious uh, buildings, uh, shrines, temples, where uh, Christians, Jews, Muslims worship side by side. Um, I remember when I was younger going to Damascus. You wouldn't go there today because of the war. But when I was there, I went to the, um, uh, the Abbasid um, mosque. And, you know, there were, there were people from all different kinds of religions going there because of the various artifacts they have, including, I think, the head or the heart, I can't remember which, of John the Baptist. Um, and um, it was just really interesting to see the different religions side by side, you know, that, that we often sort of think of as enemies. Which um, then leads me to a subsequent point. Another person that weighed in on this controversy, um, even though his book was written prior to 9-11, um, the thesis that it uh, uh, offered became very sort of influential after 9-11 among certain people, and that is Benjamin Barber's notion of jihad versus macro, which is this idea that uh, globalization itself um, has a kind of um, um, alienating um, um, presence in the people, present lives of many people, um, that it's uh, consumerism, um, is seen by many people as a type of moral relativism and you can see why that might be so because as we become a consumeristic society I tend to put me 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 and the way I look and the way I feel and um, the brands that I wear um, you know as the sort of become the, my primary concerns of my daily life which is kind of sad um, in some ways and that jihad for Benjamin Barber is not a um, uh, kind of an Islamist phenomena. They've, the, the, the idea of jihad for Benjamin Barber is a reaction, a particularist reaction, um, a, a reaction of religious identity to this globalization of the McDonald's consumeristic culture. So jihad versus Macworld is an interesting hypothesis for us to think about there because for Barber, uh, you know, the Westboro Baptist Church here in the United States, a radical religious Christian uh, organization, um, that has brought um, a lot of grief into many people's lives with the way that they protest, um, you know, is seen as just as much a jihad organization because it's reacting to the individualism of modern consumerism and the sort of licentiousness of modern consumerism um, and protesting that in a very public way. Um, so for Barber, that's as much jihad as the... Uh, the, 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 the terrorism of radical Muslims um, because they are fighting in a way for the same goal. They're both reactions to Macworld, uh, whereas most modern consumers from here to Cairo to Singapore and Tokyo, um, you know, what we all share is this sort of um, taste in, in pop music, blue jeans, Marlboro cigarettes and, and Pepsi Cola. Um, and, and many people from traditional backgrounds don't appreciate that at all. So we're nearing the end of our lecture, folks, and it remains for me just to talk about Paul Mason. We'll have more detailed comments on Paul Mason next week, but um, specifically for the first half of the book, it's important to sort of see the transition from Graeber, who is more theoretical in nature, to Mason, who really, I think, starts to unpack for us some of the empirical um, dynamics of what happened um, after uh, 20, two, uh, 2008 um, with the financial meltdown. By 2011, um, we had a, a rather unexpected phenomena that, as, as he says, nobody saw it coming. Um, nobody saw the wave of resistance that swept over the world from Tahrir Square to Occupy Wall Street all happened in the space of a few months. Um, and it resulted in major governmental change and transformation in the Middle East, in Egypt, in Tunisia, uh, arguably in Libya and in Syria as well, um, uh, in Greece, in Ireland, Spain, Portugal, Britain, and here in the US, as well as even in places like Hong Kong. Um, this idea of occupy, um, this idea of a kind of a lowercase a anarchism, as Graeber was talking about it, um, really kind of swept the planet. And um, so Mason takes Graeber's ideas in some respects and tries to apply them to this idea of a global revolution and, and take this idea of, of, a, of a global lowercase a anarchist moment. Um, uh, now, why had no one seen it coming? Because no one was really paying attention to the brewing discontent among young people um, who were suffering predicaments of um, 
<coughs> you know, having graduated from college, excuse me, <coughs> having graduated from college and finding in the financial crisis that there were no jobs to hire them um, after um, the 2008 financial crisis because the global economies had constricted so much. So um, two key concepts then, I think, in the first part of the Graeber uh, of the Paul Mason text that I want you guys to be looking out for this week, um, the, the, the idea of this global wave of resistance um, that no one saw coming. So be sure to check out that chapter and find out why uh, Mason is arguing that no one saw it coming. And then specifically then focus in, I think it's chapter four, uh, you'll see it in the contents of your book, um, the the idea of the graduate with no future um so so it's uh, something just to focus in on in the in the book um when we uh look specifically at the events in tunisia which is where all of this started uh hard to believe that it ends up in occupy wall street but if you go back to the beginning of it um you had um young men uh having studied very hard in college gotten engineering degrees and what have you uh, finding themselves in Tunisia in the midst of an economic recession uh, where there are no jobs and it's humiliating for them. Um, they try to go down to the uh, uh, a marketplace and get part-time jobs selling fruit in the marketplace and they find out that the marketplace is all stitched up, that they can't get the work, they can't get the jobs and the guy's like, my god, you know, I, not only can I not get a job as an engineer, I can't even get a job as a bloody fruit salesman in the marketplace, you know, there's literally no future for me. And so in a very remarkable moment of despair and a, and a very profound political expression, um, there were a spate of like five or six uh, self-immolations um, in Tunisia, which spread into Egypt as well. And a self-immolation is where literally someone will go and uh, set themselves on fire in front of the town hall or in front of a government building to protest uh, the condition of the youth um, and the fact that there are no jobs. So it really is a sort of an act of tremendous desperation and despair. Uh, young people saw this as a signal uh, that they weren't alone in their suffering, um, that that people around um, them were experiencing the same thing. And it, it, it gave them a sort of a sense of solidarity. You know, Paul Mason talks very richly in the opening chapter of this book about this sort of idea when people are going down to Tahrir Square in Egypt that they kind of caught each other's eyes. You know, you might have been hiding out in your house, um, doing whatever you're doing, and you look out the door and you're wondering, you've heard rumors about a protest, and you look out the door and you see people going down and your eyes catch their eyes and you can see and you can recognize each other without words. Um, you know where they're going and you know what they're going to do and you just go out and join them. It's kind of like what we sometimes call in political science a, a Berlin Wall moment. The Berlin Wall moment was when the Berlin Wall came tumbling down. Um, and um, it, spontaneously, you have this act of civil disobedience. Um, I think arguably that's what Paul Mason's trying to get at, the, uh, the kicking off everywhere um, that spread around the world in 2011. And then in stops and fits, resurfaced again in 2012, resurfaced again in 2013 in places like Brazil and Turkey, uh, Geji Park in Turkey, um, you know, saw a very, very similar uh, moment. So, so I, arguably... Um, this type of protest uh, is not done yet. It's not over. Uh, we could still see it again. Uh, it's not clear. Um, we haven't seen too much of it the last year or two, but I, I think, um, you know, it, it, it's, uh, that it, it, it's still with us, I think, and the energy and the memory of it is still with us. I think it was instrumental, for example, in defeating Mitt Romney in, uh, in the 2012 election um, uh, for various reasons. We can talk about them another time, but um, I, I think very clearly, and some of you called this out in your journals this week, it was instrumental in putting Bernie Sanders into a place where he was nominated um, for, um, for um, or almost, he was in the running to be nominated for the Democratic Party's candidacy, using arguments that sounded very much like those of Occupy Wall Street. So that's it for uh, this week, guys. Again, sorry about the technological delays. Um, I wish there was something I could have done to stop it, um, but uh, hopefully you uh, are able to watch this okay, and um, I'll post your, um, your um, checklist um, with this video, and uh, we will see you again soon. Thank you.